uh, I am Matt, um, and my task for today is to talk a little bit more about what uh, Centricia does for ecosystems and also what the community that Centricia commonly lives in, the biological soil crust, what that does for ecosystems. So just a reminder, um, a biological soil crust is a soil surface community and um, they vary widely from place to place. They are engineered generally by various types of organisms that live in close proximity and have some characteristics in common like des desiccation tolerance. But they include cyanobacteria, mosses, lichens, and you can see a little bit of, of all that going on here, okay? Um, so they vary widely and they're also widely distributed. Um, you find them in um, water limited dry places and you find them in um, cold places as well. And this photograph on the uh, right side, uh, that happens to be a very cold and very dry place, the Gurban Tungut Desert of China. And um, uh, in a system like this, you can see just how important uh, biological soil crusts can be because they are everything black that you see here. They're the dominant living, living color, dom dominant living anything uh, in this uh, photograph. Um, and aside is um, this happens to be a Centricia cannonervus dominated uh, biological crust. Okay, so why do we, so they can be um, wide, they are widespread and they can um, be a dominant living color or cover, but what do they actually do? Um, I'm going to focus on just three things today. I'm going to talk about how bio crusts influence hydrology and water inputs into ecosystems. Uh, I'm going to talk about how they aggregate soil and therefore resist erosion. And I'm going to also talk about um, how they build and maintain soil fertility. So we'll start with the hydrology and water inputs. So the first thing I want to say is that biocrests regulate how much rainwater can get into the soil. And uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to um, uh, work on a study uh, about this. And we were interested, whoops, we were interested in measuring um, infiltration of water into soil using uh, a cool tool called the disk permeometer. It's basically like a column of water that steadily delivers water. Uh, to the soil. And uh, we were interested in uh, what controls that rate. Is it uh, proximity to uh, the dominant grasses? This was in Spain, by the way. Is it the amount of biological soil crust cover? Or is it digging disturbance by rabbits? And what we found was that um, the rabbits didn't really have a direct effect on infiltration rate. Uh, but both stipa and biological soil crust did. And it was kind of like um, uh, their, the collaboration between uh, grasses and crusts that dictated a lot of the variation in the infiltration rate. And in this ecosystem, uh, that crust effect was a positive effect, which you can see in this uh, scatter plot up in the corner over here. So um, these crusts were Centricia dominated. Centricia ruralis is a, uh, besides Cannonervus is another common biocrust moss. And uh, Centricia was uh, specifically very positively correlated with infiltration. So that was cool, uh, but this is just one ecosystem in, um, uh, with one kind of crust. Um, to get a broader picture, um, uh, another thing uh, that recently came out was uh, what's called a meta-analysis, an analysis of of all of the studies that exist on a topic. And um, a bunch of authors got together and they wanted to look at uh, what are the different influences of biocrusts on, uh, on water in dry lands of the world. And we were able to uh, collect studies from uh, North America, Spain, uh, Israel, China, and Australia, and a few other ones as well, and uh, have a good look at that. And uh, what we can conclude from this study is that um, biocrusts regulate most things related to soil water, 
uh, some of the things that uh, we found were that uh, if you have more bio crusts, you tend to have more soil moisture. Okay. We didn't find much of an effect on the amount of runoff or the sorptivity of soil, but we did find a uh, when there's more bio crusts, there's less infiltration and speedier time to runoff and speedier time to ponding, okay? suggesting that overall most of the studies around the world are, are different from the first one I showed you. Uh, the bio crusts are actually um, uh, promoting runoff more than they are promoting uh, infiltration. And then the biggest one of all was in sediment production. So the presence of the bio crust decreased sediment production and that that basically means water erosion, a decrease in water erosion. Okay. So um, these are pretty big effects and since these are these are the dry parts of the world, um, they're obviously pretty important because uh, water is what what limits these ecosystems and biocrest seem to control a lot of the, the levers. Uh, third thing related to water uh, has to do with uh, the fact that biocrusts can capture fog, dew, and vapor. And there's not a ton of studies on this, but I think this might sort of become the next big thing in terms of uh, ecosystem function of biocrusts. Uh, mosses in particular, like our friends in Trichia cannonervus, are really quite good at this. And it comes down to that on. Uh, the on has um, uh, little teeth on it. It's kind of jagged. And if that on is exposed to a foggy atmosphere, water will nucleate on it, especially near those little teeth. And um, as the water collects, it forms droplets. And eventually the droplets will get heavy and flow down towards the plant and hydrate it and basically turn it on and turn on the photosynthesis and all the stuff that it does. And the cool thing about it is that uh, had the biocrest not been there, nothing would have happened. That fog due or vapor would not have been captured but since the biocrest is there, it gets this bonus period of activity um, and this bonus water. Um, these mosses, um, in this case, the Centricia ruralis, they're so good at growing just on fog that we're actually growing them artificially using just fog. And uh, you, can, you can grow them in about eight weeks like that. OK, uh, I would like to move on to um, aggregation of soil and resisting erosion. We already kind of talked about it with sediment production, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more. A uh, general statement one can make is that all biocrusts bind soil particles together. It's kind of their signature move. They use stringy stuff that weaves throughout the soil and also sticky substances uh, and charge surfaces to bind soil particles together. And they make this cohesive layer, uh, horizontal layer, just on the top of the soil. Okay, and um, it's well documented that as biocrusts develop, um, the stability or the strength of those clumps of soil that are held together uh, gets stronger. Okay, so the more biocrust development you get, um, the better erosion resistance you get. So if we kind of think about, you know, what's the moss role in all of this? Um, they are no exception. Um, so here's a, a photograph of uh, a centricia stem that we grew in the greenhouse. It's, it's actually a very, it, this is ruralis. It's not a very happy one, as you can see. But uh, despite the sadness of its above ground parts, there is an impressive proliferation of rhizoids below ground. And that, all that stringy rhizoids is um, holding together all those soil particles together. And um, when soil is clumped together like that, it's much harder uh, for wind and water to carry away. Okay, um, next I'd like to touch on uh, how biocrusts build and maintain soil fertility. So they do this by multiple mechanisms. The first one we've already heard about um, before today um, and that's just carbon fixation. The fact that the dominant biocrest members, all of them, mosses, lichen, cyanobacteria, all the main ones are photosynthetic carbon fixers. And what that means is they are able to draw down CO2 out of the atmosphere and they convert it 
uh, into their bodies. They build their bodies with it. And um, uh, over the course of time, this leads to the uh, buildup and deposition of organic matter and carbon in the soil. So this activity has been uh, described by some uh, as if you were to take a um, drape, a giant leaf over the soil surface. When they're turned on, that that's about the, the flux you can observe. Um, this is important. It's important to put organic matter into soil. Um, every gardener knows this um, because organic matter is a nutrient reserve. It's got nutrients that stick to it and it's also got nutrients within it. And furthermore, um, that carbon is food for um, uh, microbes and uh, lots of uh, small animals that live in the soil as well. Okay. Um, questions for you. What is the most frequently limiting soil nutrient? Nitrogen. Yes, thank you. What's the problem with nitrogen? I believe the atmospheric nitrogen that is most prevalent is not absorbable by plants. Right. Unless you have rhizobium. Uh, uh, thank yes, <laughs> that's right. So, okay, almost all the Earth's nitrogen is in the atmosphere and as it's not a nutrient, the, the form that it's in, okay? So, um, and yet plants desperately need it. So there's kind of a natural tension going on there. How are they gonna get it? So you need a special process and it's called nitrogen fixation, okay? And basically what goes on with that is you've got the N2 gas, the same N2 gas that you're breathing right now uh, is uh, drawn in and it's converted by organisms into ammonium and ammonium is a nutrient, okay? This can only be done by bacteria. Uh, you mentioned rhiz rhizobium, that's true. That is a, a root symbiont of some plants. Uh, but then there's also other bacteria that do this, including several cyanobacteria that inhabit uh, the biocrusts. And they may be living alone completely by themselves. They may be living within a lichen as a photobiont, or commonly they're epiphytes uh, on mosses or uh, benefit from close proximity to mosses. Uh, but these organisms are drawing in nitrogen and building up that most essential of uh, plant nutrients, or the most limiting, I should say. Okay, the last one uh, regarding soil fertility is dust trapping. So atmospheric dust is uh, small particles of soil that have become airborne and that are transported by wind. And uh, in order to be transported long distances, they have to be really small. So dust is uh, usually uh, clay particles. And the important thing about clay is that it has a charged surface. And that means that charged um, nutrient ions can cling to it like static cling. And uh, this dust, this dust uh, can settle out of the atmosphere. And if it encounters a biocrust like this Centricula ruralis clump, um, that may end up being the perfect dust trap because of its uh, carpet-like um, uh, architecture. It's got these little spaces in between the stems, little dust particles can fall down in there, and then you know, it would take a tornado to blow them back out. So they accumulate over time. So there's some data on this, and um, it turns out um, that uh, in this case, this Mallon Cooper study, these are biocrest organisms from Australia, that most of the organisms are very well capable of trapping sediments like this that fall on them out of the sky. And some of the most prolific ones end up being mosses, which are shaded in the light gray. Okay, so um, my main point here today is that Biocrusts are essential to ecosystems, uh, particularly ones that are limited by water or ones that are limited by temperature. They have this pervasive multifaceted influence on soil water. They resist soil erosion by binding soil particles together. 
they accumulate carbon, nitrogen, and other nutrients. And um, I had to leave a lot out just for time purposes, but if you want to learn about some different biocrest functions, like how they affect albedo and energy balance, or how they influence the development of the plant community or the microbial community, uh, here's a couple more uh, papers that you may want to uh, check out. But I'll end there. <laughs>